Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, and welcome to the Nano Hub U course Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. I'm Tim Fisher, and we're starting week four today. Uh, we're talking this week about a uh, really looking at the transport part of the problem. So far, we've done some basics, some statistics, uh, some other properties, especially specific heat. Um, and we haven't really talked yet too much about transport, although at the end of the last week, we did a little bit of kinetic theory. And this week is going to be all about transport, and we're going to derive a number of, of very interesting uh, features, uh, properties of nanomaterials, and then go all the way up to the bulk using a formalism called Landauer transport uh, theory. So that's that's where we're going to start. And so uh, we're going to go back. We'll, we'll remind ourselves of the first thing that we talked about. Uh, in the course, and that was that we, we really wanted to understand how heat flows from a hot reservoir to a cold reservoir that's connected by some kind of device. That device could have uh, a number of different features to it. We've drawn it here as a cylinder. It could have a, a different kind of cross-sectional shape. Um, here we've we've looked at uh, or we've we've highlighted the contact area, but we know that for lower dimensional materials, maybe that area is in fact a line, or if it's a one-dimensional problem, it's just a point. Uh, but at the end of the day, we said that we would we would derive the rate of heat flow, that's the capital Q, as an integral of a number of different terms. And we've covered most of them so far, but not all. Um, the, the first term in the inside the integrand is the number of modes, and we're going to spend a lot of time this week talking about that term. The energy uh, is h bar omega, which uh, is, is somewhat specialized to phonons, but if it weren't phonons, then we would put something else in there for electrons. We'd put energy or energy relative to the chemical potential. The transmission function we haven't talked much about. We'll have to wait a little bit for that. And then the last two terms, the difference, uh, that's the difference in the distribution functions in the hot and the cold reservoirs. So this is a, a bit of a busy slide, and I don't want to overly complicate things, but I do want to go through this in, in a, a, a bit of detail. What we're interested in is looking at heat flowing from one reservoir to the other, and then later we'll subtract that. Uh, we'll, uh, rather, we'll subtract the reverse heat flow to get a net heat flow. So I'm going to call the, call the uh, symbol J. That's going to be a heat flux. That's going to be heat flow rate, that's Q, per unit area of the problem. Again, we're looking at different dimensionality, so area in three dimensions is true area, meters squared, for example. But in a two-dimensional problem, an area is really a line length, and in a one-dimensional problem, area doesn't have much meaning. So let's look at the terms in this equation. The first term is, is the normalizing term. Again, a flux has a, a basis. Uh, it's divided by a length scale. Now, it's, in this case, we're showing it as length to the power d. So if I had a three-dimensional problem, that would be length cubed. And you might say, well, normally we think of three-dimensional fluxes as per unit area. And indeed, that's what we would get from this, from this expression because the velocity of the particle, that's the first term in the summation, the velocity uh, has the units of length in the numerator in the direction of energy flow. And that's also an important point here. We're actually showing this as the group velocity in the x direction. We're going to have to do a little bit of geometry um, and study that and, and uh, average over some geometrical spaces in order to, in order to uh, put that x or make sure that we're keeping track of, of the direction of heat flow. The second term in the summation is the energy minus the chemical potential. Now, for phonons, the chemical potential is zero. But for electrons, it's, it's finite in general. And that term really, what it says is that when, when something's carrying energy from one place to another, in this case from the left contact to the right contact, uh, that it's possible and, and common that when it moves out of the contact, it needs to be replaced by something else, by another carrier of the same type, in order to maintain some other thermodynamic equilibrium. So that's what mu stands for. So you can think of that as the replacement energy of, of the thing that has to replace the, the particle that's transporting. 
The third term is, is a cursive T, and that is the transmission function. So I want to also be very clear that that's not temperature. And even though you'll see in, in other places, you'll see, not in this course, but in other similar courses, you'll see that uh, the regular T used for the transmission function. Here we're, we're going to use the script or cursive type T. And then the last term here is the, is the uh, distribution function in the contact. So that's in the left contact where, where we have a temperature of T1. And the C0 term, it's a little bit confusing and, and there's a lot of discussion about it among the physicists. That's the, the zero point energy term. We're gonna find that that cancels out with the reverse direction flow anyway. So, so don't worry about it too much. We can compare this to the expression that we had for internal energy where we had energy, uh, the, just the total energy, times the distribution function. So here, when we start to put transport into the problem, we now have a velocity, we have a, a chemical potential, we have a transmission function, and so that's the, um, that, that complicates things a little bit, these other terms, and that, those are the ones that we really want to get after. Um, we will say, we'll, we'll go through a number of different examples uh, as the course proceeds and in and, and homework as well. What we need to do now as I said before, is to subtract the reverse flow or the reverse flux in this case. And so I've just basically taken that equation uh, that we had before for the left to right flow and I've put it in this, equa in the, in this broader equation twice, but there's a very su small subtlety to this equation and that is you'll, you'll notice that we're adding terms together, but the second summation in the second term is for kx less than zero. That means that the velocity term will be negative. When we recognize that, and we have to assume a little bit about the, the symmetry of the case space in, in doing this, uh, but that's, that's a second order effect and, and this is typically done, uh, that assumption is, is almost always valid. So that negative sign actually comes into the bottom equation where we have all of the same terms in each of the two, uh, the two top terms in the equation. And so in that second layer of equation there, we've just taken that minus sign for the VX, VGX and we put that into, um, into the minus sign before its distribution function. You'll notice also that, as I said before, the zero point energy uh, does cancel with itself. This transmission function, I think it's important to note, it actually can incorporate a lot of different physical effects and we haven't yet touched on them yet. All we've done is some very, very simple scattering at the end of last week, but things like tunneling could be involved here, boundary reflection, and so forth. So we'll get to that in the following week. Um, we also have assumed here, and this is, this is very important as well, that the chemical potentials of the two reservoirs, of the two contacts, are the same. If that weren't true, then we would have some extra terms that were non-thermal to, to account for some energy flows that were non-thermal, and in this course, for our purposes, we're going to focus just on thermal transport. So we can confine this to one-dimensional systems. We apply it to a, a purely one-dimensional system where we have, again, a, a one-dimensional reservoir on the left, a one-dimensional reservoir on the right, and a one-dimensional device between. Now, you've you probably realized by now that those summations over k-space are usually uh, cumbersome and and unwanted, so we convert that to to a uh, to the, an inter integral. Again, we use that two pi over l concept that we had before to convert the uh, the summation to an integral in k space. And in one dimension, k space is very simple. It's only this this idea of of a directionality of the group velocity doesn't really matter because it it only can go in one direction, either left or right, and and nothing else. So that leaves us with a fairly simple expression for this heat flux. And I will also reiterate that in one dimension, there's no normalizing uh, length scale to make it a flux, right? There is no area. Area is essentially non-existent in a one-dimensional system. And so that's why you don't, you don't see this. The units of this, um, of, of this term would be watts. And you can go through the, the different terms in the equation and you can see that. The velocity has units of meters per second. The energy would have units, for example, of joules. And then the other 
terms in the integrand are, are dimensionless, the transmission function and the distribution functions, and then k has units of 1 divided by length, which cancels out the length in the group velocity. That leaves us with energy per unit time. The time term comes from the, from the denominator of the group velocity. So that would give us something like watts. So then we go to uh, two-dimensional systems. Life gets a little bit more complicated because we have to account for the directionality of the, of the carriers. So again, we, we look at this and we're, we're going to integrate over a, an angular space, that's theta, and we say that the group velocity in the x direction is the total magnitude of the group velocity times cosine theta. And what we really need to do is then just average over that cosine theta term. There are some assumptions that we make along the way that are very important. For example, the, the transmission function going from the second row equation to the third row equation, you have to assume that the transmission function does not depend on the direction of the carrier, that's theta. And so that's, a, that's you know, perhaps a dubious assumption. In fact, in many cases it is. But to get a, a reasonable solution, many times that, that assumption is made that the form of that transmission function can be very complicated in energy space and in, uh, in, in real space, directional space. So the integral, the average of cosine theta integrated from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, because remember we're just interested in a rightward moving direction, uh, that average is 2 over pi. So the average of that shows up in this in this equation in the in the third row where we we combine that with the four over pi squared that we had um, in the in the second row equation. So that's the, the two-dimensional problem still also pretty simple. I'll note that uh, we're still in k-space though and we might want to change that and we will in a moment. Uh, for three dimensions we have the the cosine theta term but in this case we're actually having to integrate over a solid angle. If you'll recall, a solid angle is sine theta d theta d psi. In this case, we've, we've used psi. And so those we, we carry out those integrals again, and uh, you can convince yourselves that as long as no other term in the equation depends on the direction, and in fact, group velocity, of course, could depend on those directions as well. Um, and that, that's another assumption that we have to make uh, in order to get uh, tractable uh, end results for, for thermal transport in most cases. And so what we do, even though we will take the same results that we had before when we were assuming things about the, the spatial uniformity in the previous equations, we're integrating now over frequency space. And to do that, to, to go from a k-space integral to a frequency space integral, we introduce the density of states, which we've covered uh, quite a bit in the, in the previous weeks. And then we have these other terms, the velocity, we have the energy, the transmission function, and the difference in the, uh, in the distribution functions. And again, because we're specializing to phonons here, that's the Bose-Einstein distribution function. Um, I will note that I've written these equations maybe a bit curiously, uh, where I put a one-half times uh, a second term that has a velocity in it. In the, in the one-dimensional case, it's just the group velocity. Uh, there's there's a, a good reason for that. Um, those velocities are actually the average velocities um, of the of the carriers in the in the direction of transport. We mentioned that we were doing those cosine theta integrals or cosine theta averages in two dimensions and three dimensions, and it turns out that uh, that those averages actually come together and just form that group of terms. And so it's it's quite nice to think about it this way. And, and you'll see the utility of thinking about the, it this way when we talk about the, the number of modes later this week. For electrons, we see a very similar grouping of terms. In this case, of course, we have a finite chemical potential, so we have to put that in here. Um, and we, we now use Fermi-Dirac statistics, but essentially everything else is the same. Uh, and the density of states, however, is a little bit different. It's now in, in energy space for electrons rather than frequency space for phonons, and that's just by convention. I hope you know that you know, we could convert between the two quite easily because energy is just h-bar times omega regardless of the type of carrier that you're, that you're talking about.
So that's it for today. And we will come back the rest of the week and, and talk about a number of different issues related to transport. Thanks.